Welcome back yeah. to the Otherworldly Show. Uh, this is Keeping the Changing Times, Changing Worlds topics we cover in the November conference available all year long. Uh, we I enjoy divination, magic, complementary and alternative healing methods, uh, ghosts and other supernatural beings, fairies, uh, uh, spiritual practice, and anything spooky folk. If it's called supernatural, paranormal, metaphysical, cult, uh, we'll figure out a uh, way to bring it into the light and share it. I, I am Chippecon. I am your host. And tonight my guest is Carenza, who is uh, a, uh, he had a magical upbringing due to his Romney and Native American heritage. He's an uh, anthropologist, among other things, university trained yeah. artist. He's, he's an art, he has, I'm, I, I'm a palmist. He has whorls on all 10 fingers. He can't help being an artist. No matter how many different jobs he tried, he was going to come back to being an artist because he couldn't help it. When you have whorls on all 10 fingers, the average person has four whorls on four, three to four fingers. No, he's, he had to be an artist. But he does anything. He's done nursing. He's done uh, jewelry making. He's got a huge yeah. range of knowledge in many areas. Um, and... Tonight we're talking about Mana. Uh, well, I found out chatting to him once that his his grandmother had a had a uh, box which we determined was probably made available <laughs> during the culture of the twenties uh, or thirties when Wilhelm Reich stuff was going around, and it was and, and that was part of his life, and he so. After he heard what on one of our shows about making mana plates, the way Serge King uh, told us, he said, I'm going to try and make a mana box because that reminds me of my grandmother's magic box that she had on her altar. So I, before I turn him loose on you, I'm going to show you how Serge taught us how to make mana plates because I didn't do that when we were talking about it before. You take your handy wrap and you just take a piece of it. Okay, if I can find the serrated thing. And you take a piece of aluminum foil, which I am old enough that I still tend to call it tin foil. <laughs> I think it's been tin foil since I've been alive. But... And you just take one and you put them on so they're line one of them is lining the other. Of course, the saran wrap or uh, plastic wrap is going to try and escape. But the tin foil, see, I did it again, is, is a lot more cooperative. And so you put them together, and then if you fold them, first I fold it in three, and we now have uh, three layers of organic, inorganic, organic, inorganic. And then if you fold it again, uh, we now have six. We fold it again. Well, actually, I'm gonna, I've got a little flappy edges here, so I'm gonna fold it in three again, and that makes three times three is nine. There. Then I'll do it again. Now this is a useful size. This is the size I tend to make because I tend to use them as like a Band-Aid. If you have a bleed, if you're bleeding, you just put it on there for about less than a minute, it'll stop the bleeding. I don't know why. I mean, frankly, it reminds me of tinfoil hats and makes me feel like I'm a nut, <laughs> but it works. And uh, and it's cheap. And if you have one, if you have children, you have or grandchildren, you have one of these around, then you you don't have to go through many many boxes of band aids unless you want to. Your choice. Uh, Carenza unfortunately has no camera to show us his lovely face, but he will speak now. Speak, Carenza. We are you are here to listen to you. <laughs> well. When I made mine, I did it a little differently. 
Um, I was thinking yardage for some reason. <laughs> so I took the big roll of aluminum foil and the big roll of plastic and set them side by side and started wrapping around an 18 by 24 canvas for painting. And that gave me, as I'm wrapping, I got 36 layers before I ran out of aluminum foil. Um, and I have to say, if you're going to make one of these, you really do want to go and get one of the big commercial rolls of aluminum and commercial rolls of uh, plastic wrap. And then I cut it apart and I had 48 inch long, 36 layers of plastic and aluminum, which believe it or not, was really kind of fluffy and thick. And uh, the immediate thought my, that went through my head is this is never going to do. So I ironed it because of my, for some reason in my mind, I thought, well, the plastic might melt, but it's going to just act like wonder under. It's going to glue everything together, which it appears to have done. So then I had a flat sheet of thick layers of plastic and aluminum. And I was looking at a cardboard box I had going, how in the world am I going to hold this on on the cardboard box? And I decided that the Wonder Under was the perfect answer. And I used heat and bond and ironed it onto the box going all the way around, folded in the bottom and ironed that on and voila big box and then went well I want the outside covered up with something a little more durable than this aluminum and went over it with iron on interfacing the just stuff used for sewing which made it durable so I have it in my hand it's actually quite heavy much heavier than I thought it would be. Well, 36 layers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I, it, 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 it will not weigh a lot more than a, a, two roll, a roll of plastic wrap and a roll of uh, uh, tin foil. Right. Yeah. Uh, and um, a box. But Definitely, though, uh, the more layers, I think, works better than just a little bit. Um, so when you use the wonder under on the um, outside, what did what did you did you put the, something outside that then? No, I just I have um, fusible interfacing on the outside, which is very very good because for some reason the cats are fascinated with it. <laughs> um, and part of my mind says, well, that's because it's a box, but since it's a box that not all of them can get into. I'm not sure why they're still fascinated with it. Um, the kittens, I understood when they all crawled into it because it's a box. But I'm just going to say, because knowing that he didn't have it, I took a box and made a six layer thing and used the, uh, one, the um, fusible interfacing. And, uh, made myself a box. Oh. So this is this is what you can look like. I suppose if you want, you could make the lid. Um, you can see that I had it. It's, it's a cookie box. But. Well, yeah, and if you put your hand in it, you can definitely feel it on the inside, can't you? Um. I bet you can feel it more with yours with 36 layers rather than six. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I can definitely feel it. It's like active or tingly or something. So that is how I made it. Um, Could you describe your grandmother's? My grandmother's was silvered glass. And when we looked at the very, very edge, we could see all the little infinitesimally thin layers of silver and glass. 
and hers was probably right about the same size, about 10 inch cube uh, to what mine is. And it was quite heavy. And uh, had just the little metal edges and hinge for the lid. Which naughty little Carenza peeled off so that you could see the layers. <sighs> yes. And it was one of those things that uh, I never actually learned from them how to make one simply because they had one. Why did they ever need to make one? And what did she do with it? Oh, what didn't she do with it? She put pretty much like any of her house plants that were ailing, she would put them in it. Uh, she would put her herbs in it. If she was doing things like vibrational uh, elixirs, at some point they would go into it. And uh, pretty much she used it, as I'm recalling this, to charge things or to heal them. And she also used it to preserve things, and my grandfather's razor blades used to go into it. Ooh. <laughs> and um, we'll probably end up touching more on that, but that was to sharpen them. Uh, and we talked about I had put my needles in it because I was thinking I was going to do a needle case made out of them, because if they're good at sharpening things, but they're just as good at sharpening the back of needles as they are the end, the front. Uh, so it really afterwards, after I had the needle in it for a couple of days and I took it out and I started using it, um, it tore my hands up because every time I went to push my needle through the cotton, it would go into my fingers. Um, the end. So whether I was intending to sharpen the back of the needle or not, it did. So that was one of the tests I did at home with the box. And I went, yeah, this might need some more thought. And I've been thinking maybe I need to do a needle case with them that uh, keeps the eye end of the needle out of the field because I'm not so sure it's a great thing to have that sharp too. Uh, and that was pretty much it. I did do some tests with, I had a plant that got spider mites. And I have to say that um, I sprayed for the spider mites and put the plant in the box and it healed the spider mites like you wouldn't believe. <laughs> uh, the spider they, mites or the damage? The, the spider mites, it, it, they were doing great. Oh. When I took the plant back out, I mean, the spider mites had really enjoyed that healing field. And I ended up having to treat the plant again and wait until the spider mites are gone to put the plant in. And it perked back up. But... It doesn't seem like the box has a good grasp of what I want it to do. Uh, it's perfectly willing to heal the spider mites. It's perfectly willing to sharpen the blunt end of needles. Uh, so it takes a little more thought on, do we want to design for a specific use like a needle case, uh, how do you want to do that so that only the sharp ends, the business end of the needles are in it? Um, I haven't figured out a way to get the box to not help the spider mites along. Uh, I'm not sure there is a way because I have a feeling that anything that can heal is going to profit from the field. Uh, it did remind me of uh, my grandmother's box in a number of ways. Uh, it wasn't particularly good at stopping mold from growing on open jelly. 
And I have a feeling that that's because it's not actually a stasis field, which is, in my mind, it might have worked that way, but no, it didn't work that way. Um, it, it was pretty good for uh, overnight mold. And I'm not sure that that was terribly useful. Uh, it just seems like it should preserve food, but I don't think that that's actually what the field does. But wouldn't it be wonderful if it did? Uh, and that is most of the testing I've gotten done on it. I mean, I've tried a few other simplistic things. Uh, and I understand that while you would have liked to have gotten the box, your sister was the one who cleaned the house after your grandmother died. No, my, oh, <laughs> when my grandmother was still in the hospital, my aunt Harriet, yeah. who drove up from Ohio, mm. went in and got all of the things that she considered valuable, antique, etc., cetera, no. and took them. And ran off with them. And whether or not there is actually any value to the boxes my grandmother had, um, the fact that my aunt thought there was is enough. And my aunt is a... Um, Bible beating evangelical Christian. So anything that had anything to do with my grandmother's um, non Christian behaviors were a casualty of her visit. Um, so you think probably the box? Yeah, I, I think that it, it actually, I, I know that she took, took it and she took the pyramid. But I don't actually think it survived her taking it mm -hmm. because, um, well, for some reason, my aunt seems to think that she's doing everything, everyone a favor if she destroys anything that has to do with anything not her particular flavor of Christianity. I'm sure everyone has met someone, something like that, um, who doesn't like some aspect of something in their family and tries to wipe it out. That's my aunt. So I don't actually have uh, access to my grandmother's box or her pyramid. Um, I am so sorry for your losses in that area. Well, it is what it is. But yeah. so I can't really set them side by side, compare them. I wish I could. Uh, it does tell me something that the cats, even the ones that can't fit into it, are absolutely fascinated with it. So the outside that is covered with the iron-on interfacing has all sorts of little cat claws <laughs> marks in it because they absolutely love to get their paws on it and try to get their body into it and it doesn't work um it's just She's not big her. enough but how what, what how big is yours it's about 10 inches cute okay well, I, I looked around the house and looked for, you know, what, what was, I wanted it to be big enough to put a plant in. This really isn't big enough to put a plant in. I'm yes, gonna it is. In. I'm going to put it, it on is, the floor. It is floor plenty so big enough for a plant. What, what were you thinking of for a plant? Something hedge high? You can put a no, six no, inch. No, the, the house plants, but, but it's, it's only... Uh, about, let's see what that says. It's only about 13 centimeters uh, long and 
Back, back when I had house plants, they would be two feet. 10 centimeters is significantly smaller than 10 inches. So there you go. I, I am uh, pretentiously using metric <laughs> days until the rest of the world, until the rest of America catches up. <laughs> well, I could fit something like an African violet, something like that in mine. Oh, yeah. The, many, many little plants would. But. Yes. Well, only a little plant is going to fit in mine. Um, and I have been putting the it on my list. The kittens still do. <laughs> they still do. Um, Kern says, has raised some kittens for me. I've got to go pick them up. Uh, <laughs> but kittens aren't that much bigger than a house plant. Uh, so... There is that. I do want to try vibrational elixirs in it and see if it increases their efficiency. Uh, that, however, takes a little more time than just here, let's throw this in. Does it help? Uh, so, well, that actually, is. It, it, unless people have some questions, I was going to say maybe we could talk a little bit about the vibrational elixirs. But, uh, but I do want to know if anybody has any questions about the... Uh, the, the, uh, the, the box and, you know, and mana plates and, I mean, well, it, it Wilhelm Wright. Uh, judging, by, judging by the description, it's definitely one of Reich's Oregon boxes because he... When he was doing his experiments in Germany, he tended to use silvered glass. So that probably was one of Reich's originals. And that's where she came, my grandparents uh, on my father's side came from was Germany. So that's probably that that thing would be priceless. Yeah. Oh. I have a question. If no one else does, uh, I understand the concept of alternating organic and inorganic, and I can understand the aluminum foil as inorganic, but plastic as organic. I have trouble wrapping my head around that one. Trolling. Plastic is an organic material. It, it's a, a hydrocarbon yeah. polymer. I think the point here is that when you talk about an orgone box or a mana storage device, from an engineering standpoint in the dull, boring, ordinary world, we're talking about a capacitor. Mm -hmm. And yeah. you need an insulator for the dielectric and a conductor to store the charge. Now, Given the thickness of your average plastic film and its electrical properties that I won't bore anybody with, uh, to, um, if you were to make up a sandwich by taking a layer of plastic and a layer of aluminum foil, rolling them up nice and tight, you could build a capacitor large enough to store a really impressive charge. Now, it also is perfectly reasonable to assume that such a device could store the subtle energies. Mm -hmm. And I think, okay, plastic has kind of got one foot in the mud of organic and one foot in the dirt of inorganic because it is, you know, but most of these things, you know, polyethylene film, whatever. So it's like sort of kind of organic you can't harvest it from trees, but it is, if you look at its properties against the aluminum foil, you have the opposite you're looking for. So if that helps clarify uh, the point of organic <laughs> for anyone, um, you know, I'm happy to contribute there. Thanks. Actually, what you were right, it they are insulators. That's why the ones made with glass work. 
Yes. I've also seen them. I've also seen them made with wax paper. Okay, oh, I, now you now you go back to my youth, but that's okay. Yep. I have put them in the. Um, I thought about using the wax paper. Uh, I put mm -hmm. them in the um, in, in the chat. The address uh, for uh, YouTube that shows somebody making a a small one, but they're making it what well, looks like a large can uh which strikes me as odd but i have mm -hmm. and they're it. sewing it on a machine and yeah they are some kind of fabric or something yeah and i've got let me see if i can share <coughs> you should be able to excuse me share my screen yeah make sure you click there. the sound what what would you say and when you select which screen to use to share there's a little checkbox down there for making sure the sound from it is shared as well. Oh, is there? Yep. Do, 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 do. Otherwise, we won't hear uh, it. Share, share computer sound. Okay, there. Now, if I can choose that one. And it's spinning and deciding if it's going to do it. To share, please. Mm. Yeah, get there. Some audio advice. Arr, I hate you. Don't be silly. Buffering, oh. please wait. Oh, can you see it now? No. Oh, there it is. It just arrived. There, there we go. go. Yes. Okay. So can you see this? Yes. There we go. And and if you look at it, you can see there is a diagram here, and it shows the orgon accumulator. Here we have a photograph of one. This is over in Kauai, and you can see the it where they've used something metallic and the, got a seat inside it. Um, there's an orgone box with an orgone shooter. I don't know um, quite how that works, but it looks like they're made of funnel and a hose. Oh boy, do we have and wool. the orgone blanket is, is about the same. It says wool, steel, wool, wool, steel, wool, wool. Um, and in case you can't read it easily, I'll read it out loud. Orgone accumulators, devices invented by Wright in 1940 to concentrate orgone energy for use in treating a wide variety of illnesses and injuries. The blanket, the walls of the box, the sides of the cabinet consist of layers of organic material alternated with inorganic material. Steel, wool, glass insulation, or sheet metal might be layered with wool, cotton, or plywood. Treatment was accompanied by sitting in the cabinet or applying the blanket or funnel-shaped shooter to the afflicted areas of for periods of time ranging from 10 minutes to a half an hour. Now, 10 minutes to a half an hour is not a whole lot. But, no, um, it's, it's not unreasonable for common treatment times in alternative medicine. Yeah. Now I have to remember how to turn this off. <laughs> Top of the screen. Okay. Stop sharing. You'll find it in red. I'm looking for it. There oh. it is. Stop share. <laughs> I'm going to say the picture went away. Thank you. But... Okay. Well, when you, if you share a YouTube video, make sure to share the sound. Thank you. That's uh, really important. So anyway, so so that is um, that's what Wright did with it uh, to to heal people. When you make a box of big enough for a person. If you want to heal a cat. You only need to make a box big enough for a cat. Maybe that's what Schrodinger was up to. <laughs> <laughs> now, the question, one of the questions is, does expensive stuff work better? You know, I keep thinking oh. about um, <coughs> how, how in magic frequently we have uh, the question of, well, do you need virgin parchment? And it's like, well, uh, versus people who do conjure use brown paper bags. And uh, do you know, should you wrap your, your uh, tarot cards in silk? If so, no, I just stick them in my pocket. Um, it's, I don't think that expensive stuff necessarily works better. I think the idea of virgin parchment meant that you weren't going to have something uh, <laughs> that you didn't know that had been written on it and cleaned off. <laughs> But uh, right. uh, uh, a, po a palimpsest might not be a really good thing to use that for. Right. Yeah. It would, but, even though the ink had been scraped off, 
the energy would still be there. Yep. And, and there have been studies that have shown that more expensive placebos work better than less expensive placebos. Yes. Well, specifically, people respond better to a placebo that is a shot than they do to a uh, placebo that is a pill, mm. which people respond better to if it's a pill rather than a uh, liquid. Uh, probably and they also definitely respond better if they think the medicine costs more. Mm -hmm. But um, that, that is something that, that, so which is why when you're doing magic as a service, it is important to put a little bit of pizzazz into it, uh, dazzle them with your fancy footwork and have some pretty, you know, sparkly things because it what you're trying to do is you're getting your energy working you're getting their energy working all healing is self-healing and if they're going to heal themselves you want to convince their subconscious wow we just did some shit uh some something sorry that explains why so many of the resin projects for organ organ collecting that i've seen have glitter and savings and yeah. things in it uh, unlike mine, which are just filled with BBs. Yeah. I have so many seed beads right, running around. I could probably put them in there. Uh, say, let's, they, let's they'd have one. to be metal. They, they've got to be metallic. Oh, they have to. Okay. Well, yeah. How about the gold line delicas then? Maybe glitter is the, the cheapest form of, uh, of uh, the metal they can find. But I was going to well, remember that line from, from uh, Jurassic Park where the lawyer says, are they heavy? They're expensive. <laughs> Mostly what I've seen the people use to make those are shavings from a machine shop. And then oh, they really? put the glitter then they put the glitter in as you know to make it look fancy. Yeah. Okay. <sighs> I should have gone down to the basement and pulled out one of the holy hand grenades. <laughs> what is a holy hand grenade? Not everybody it is Sorry, it is an orgone generator as opposed to an accumulator. Basically, it it's a flat-sided cone that from the outside basically looks like BBs in aspic. <laughs> because it's BBs in a um, polyester resin matrix, but there are buried inside, there are crystals. Oh, no. And the idea is, is it acts to accumulate and direct um, orgone energy. Okay. Like I a barrel shape? Uh, no, I actually use some dollar store Tupperware, so they're kind of cone shaped. The first <laughs> ones I ever saw were made actually using the um, plastic. Do you remember the um patty hose called legs oh god yes oh lord yes <laughs> yes yeah basically l-e-g-g-s mm -hmm. um those were the first ones i saw other ones i saw using those old white disposable cups the ones that mm -hmm. pumped popped into a uh plastic frame okay yeah i think they were among the original solo cups <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I think they were actually made by Solo back in the, yeah. those days. But Wouldn't yeah, the, the coffee, maybe. the coffee cups. Yeah, and the, and the whole leg thing was brilliant marketing. <laughs> yeah, but it, the, <laughs> those are the difference between accumulators and generators is where accumulators produce a field, generators because of the way you angle the crystals produce, as it were, a beam. Mm. So that might have been what that uh, funnel thing, the projector was, that was. Uh, no, because the, that's actually just sort of to. What it amounts to is showmanship to, to, to so that people know the energy is going from the box into them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm he also this at you. He he also had a bunch of things that were effectively test tubes stuffed with steel wool then plugged that would be placed in an orgone accumulator and could be used for 
internal application. Yeah. Okay. Remember, Reich, oh. Reich was also very big into experimenting with orgasms. Yeah, apparently he was part of the real sexual revolution back then. Yes, he was. But it was his um, cloud busting and chemtrail busting that got him thrown into prison and his stuff basically ah. collected and burned. Fraud. By the yeah. United States government. Okay. His daughter still runs an institute in Germany where most of the information I get comes from. I got a couple of his their books somewhere. Okay. In amongst all the other books. I, I used to have some, but I have no idea where they are now. Yeah, that's my problem. They're in a box down in the basement somewhere. How would styrofoam work as a container for mm -hmm. one of these box type things? So how many of you guys are, are liable to um, try and make one? Well, that's why I'm asking about the styrofoam. <laughs> mm, the pr main problem I see with styrofoam is its relative fragility. Mm. We just have a surplus of those from a med that Bill receives. So, Yeah, okay. I, get, I, I get a medication every month. And anyway. a styrofoam cooler with walls about a foot and a half thick. So if we need styrofoam for anything, please. I'd probably put the orgone plates on the inside then. That's what I was thinking. Yeah, it's a but, small inner volume with a huge outer volume of styrofoam. Yeah, and then, yeah, that would work. Okay. okay. Well, gee, Just, if you said, it would, is Tyvek all, is, uh, would Tyvek be part, uh, Organic and part inorganic. If you just put the full no, Tyvek would Tyvek would serve as the insulator. Yeah, yeah. You still need something the, metallic. Yeah, the, the technical term for ty, yeah, Tyvek. I was just what, thinking of turning your whole house into an accumulator. Tyvek, <laughs> yeah, oh, that yeah, uh, you know, a Tyvek building wrap would have an interesting effect on the building because Tyvek is what they call spun bonded polyester. They don't weave it. They make cotton candy out of it in big flat sheets. Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. the best way to understand Tyvek. Given that they make aluminum coated fiberglass panels for insulation. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now you got an go, insulator and a conductor. Go, too thick, go too thick with a layer of Tyvek in between. <clears throat> Building ancient yeah. devices with modern materials. These aren't so ancient. They were only developed oh, in the true. 40s. Yeah. yeah. You know, that, that, uh, unless you believe all the stuff they say about the Ark of the Covenant. <laughs> oh, we were well. talking about that earlier, Bill and I. Oh, is that supposed to be one too? Um, yeah, theoretically, yeah. you've got layers of gold alternating with layers of wood. Hmm. That's got the dialectic sandwich nailed down. There's yeah. Baghdad batteries. And yeah, so, well, I mean, there if, is so much that could either be one foot in the spirit world and one foot in the scientific world. And, you know, things like batteries have been proven to be quite ancient. Yeah. And this concept of layering conductors with insulators seems to be also quite ancient, even if the people who did it didn't seem to have an entirely firm clue of what they were doing doing apparently they like the result yeah well i do remember one of the stories is if you touched the ark without uh, appropriate garments which seem to be insulators you would mm. be struck dead mm -hmm. translation electrocuted and melt nazis yeah <laughs> that, and that, those that... those are angels that that's a different kettle of fish okay yeah but that makes sense because I know that even in the dull, boring modern world of the 1980s, before we invented digital power supplies, we stabilized electrical currents with capacitors. Mm -hmm. And these were commonly referred to as beer can capacitors because they were the size of beer cans with hundreds of layers. And oh, I've seen, if, I've seen them bigger than that um, at and well, a couple of atomic energy labs. Yeah, I mean, outside of the normal commercial business, 
they have built astonishingly large capacitors. And these things hold enough electricity in enough quantity to barbecue anybody that approaches them the wrong way. The Yale Atomic Energy Lab has has a bunch of one farad and a couple of 10 farad capacitors. A 10, and the ten, 10 farad capacitor? Yes. You could blow up the earth with that. Translate for us who are not physicists. The farad is a unit of capacitance named after Michael Faraday. Yeah. Common capacitors like you find in normal electronic devices are commonly measured in millionths of a farad or billionths of a farad. Oh. So a 10 farad capacitor. Um, it's 20 feet high and about and four the, feet across. And if you think did, about- Did you say that was at Yale? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, really. It, in the bit that they don't tell you about, which is an atomic reactor that they use, and sometimes they also play, let's split atoms. Yeah, they, these, some of these universities tend to put these things in the basement and not tell people. But when I think you have a grasp now the size of a 10 farad capacitor, because if you think of a farad, it is essentially a volume measurement of electricity specified as so much electricity under so much pressure. A 10 farad capacitor is a shitload of electrons under extremely high pressure. So, um, yeah, in, in fact, one of the things that is hot in rechargeable device technology today is the supercapacitor, a thing the size of your thumbnail that can hold a huge amount of electricity and spare you the nuisance of charging batteries. But again, these things, God, you know, what was that was an orgone accumulator to? What would a 10 farad capacitor be in orgone units? Probably something the size of a um, domed football stadium. All right. <clears throat> Though I'm not sure how much space you'd have. You, it could be built if you have the money and the time. And the U.S. government doesn't come and shut you down. Let's see if we can get Elon Musk interested in this. No, don't. Or, or your Aunt Harriet, who thinks that they're for the devil. You know. Anyway. Oh. I want yeah. to ask a question of Karenza. You're still there, right? Yes, I am. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry we ran away with the Orgon thing here a bit. Um. Do you have any specific plans for go going forward and studying this? How scientific are you being about it? I have been thinking about ways to alter it. Um, at this point, I've been wondering whether or not mica would be useful. Oh. Ooh, classic. And mm. I was thinking aluminum and mica. I can, uh, mm -hmm. I'm thinking that simple PVC glues would work sort of like the plastic. Yeah. And do mixing PVC glues with mica powder mm. and doing. Oh, that's interesting. That doing a layer of that between the aluminum. That does sound interesting. That would work. And I think it would work. And I am wondering if it might be more effective than just the plastic alone. A lot I, of ecologically sound glitters right now are mica powder. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think and, it might be. You would actually have to test it and see. Um, but it, but I actually need something other than just a, a box there with just the box. There's no control. Yeah. Um, 
and I can say I'm experimenting all I want, but all I'm doing is going, okay, this is what I did. This is what my results were mm. without anything to compare it to. It's not necessarily very um, efficient, but I can't get ultra thin glass. Mm-hmm. Right. And I'm going to say, what's your control for this? That is exactly what I'm lacking right now. Is I, I was going to say, it sounds like to me you're, you're complaining because you've got this really great idea, but no control right. that already exists that you can use. I almost wonder uh, if you want to have a small group um, of people communicate on the internet and work on these things. A pendulum would probably work as a simple detector. Mm-hmm. Um, checking it by the speed and direction of the pendulum swing. Okay. Because that, that's how I test and make sure my stuff is working. It, it's mm-hmm. simple, it's primitive, but it's about the only thing I've found that worked. Um, one of those little aluminum foil pinwheels that they sometimes sell as PK detectors. It's, okay. It looks like a really? little cruciform aluminum wheel sitting on a pin, and you're supposed to keep it inside a, like, uh, an old-fashioned glass dome like you'd put over a clock right. or a... Yeah. Nice. Oh, mm-hmm. yeah. A bell jar. Yeah, a bell it's jar. It's almost and like a radiometer. That, yeah, like a radiometer, but it doesn't react to light. Okay. Gotcha. It also doesn't need to be in a, in a semi-vacuum. And the idea is they... Back when they were selling them, and I think they still do, um, it was for you'd concentrate on making it move. And first you'd get it swinging one way, and then you'd get it as it were swinging the other way. Okay. And it had very uh, delicate balance and was very lightweight. And that's why the bell jar keep it from right. Being, big, right. Keep every little, every little bit of air from dealing with it. Mm-hmm. If you're trying to measure a very, very, very small force. Yeah, well, which is what we are. Yeah. What we're talking about. Well, that's what they used to have in the 60s as a, uh, to, to work on your PK, you just take a glass and you make a um, small paper fan and put it on, pin on a stand and uh, mm-hmm. put that un- under the glass and then try and move it with your mind. Because mm-hmm. it's a lot easier than, say, moving, starting with a pencil. So. Yeah. Yeah. I another, have the frame a somewhat the generic. I have a somewhat generic question for you, which Chip Gunn and Jen will immediately recognize as coming out of my own background, which is okay. We got orgone energy, uh, so we've got that categorized, but I see it as just another variation in the endless spectrum of subtle energies, all of Bingo. which derive. All of which derive from the primal energy left over from the creation of the universe. Now, I want to know where your head is at about that. Okay, I can. Which, Carenza? Who are you addressing? I, I said Carenza. Oh. Other people were talking. But I... since. You know, I really want to know you. You are heavily into orgone energy. Where do you see it fitting into the rest of reality? I think that <clears throat> when we're looking at orgone energy, we're looking at a understudied energy, mm-hmm. and that there are probably infinite energy sources that we know nothing about there are and and it's just it's like it's like peeking through a hole and hoping we're seeing the whole Mm. picture yeah yeah and the reason i raise the question is because it's a matter of thinking okay you're into the organ energy it probably has like an infinite number of brothers and sisters but mm-hmm. when you think orgone energy, do, does any other form of energy that other people have talked about, like, you know, like Star Wolf or me or Chippecon, do you see any resonance there, any linkage there? Or do you think you're onto something that is kind of novel and unique unto itself? No, I don't think it's novel and unique unto itself. I think that 
Uh, I think energy, if we are looking at its electrons moving, mm -hmm. that there could be many things that move electrons. Yes. And I listen to what people say and I think about it and I wonder how it applies to anything I'm familiar with and if mm -hmm. it applies and what I can do um, to further my understanding. That's how I will, I will express mm -hmm. that. Well, and, um, I don't actually think I'm doing anything unique. No. Mm -hmm. um, well, actually, I've got, a to I've got one of my toys here, if people can see it. Yeah. This is my original crystal wand, which is built kind of along the same lines as an orgon generator. Um, mm. It's a copper tube wrapped in an insulator. And in this case, it's got a bunch of Russian amethyst points in it. Mm. Yeah, th this, is, this is the original, you know, that I built back when Llewellyn was doing its psychic technology series. Of which I have I most of say, it. That, that thing's been around the block a couple of times. This, this is my original, as it were, Mark I. <laughs> I it was made with what I had. Yes, it, basically the rap is paracord because, well, I am who I am. <laughs> <laughs> so, Crystal Wand 1.0. Back when I bought one of Smith's books on crystal technology, I now own all three. <laughs> but I suddenly realized this this is an example. He referred to it as a man-portable particle accelerator. <laughs> In a sense, that's probably true, which kind of gets me over to my next question. We talk about moving electrons, but I don't necessarily see electrons as being part of the subtle energy spectrum. And that may be because I'm way too familiar with quantum physics. And I it's tend to... Pro it's probably yes. some of the more um, esoteric particles. Mm -hmm. Right. And I, and I think that's true because, you know, I've studied this obnoxious field to the point where I realized that the phenomenon that they refer to as the quantum foam is the boundary between material reality and the void. And mm -hmm. I suddenly made a, a connection between Zen Buddhism and quantum physics. So when I think subtle energies, I think you talk about understudied energies. How much do we know about some of these weird ass particles that they've spit out of the Large Hadron Collider and what they might have to do with us? Mm, yep. Lorenzo, what do you think of that? Oh, is that just another holy hand grenade? I think that, like when I'm looking at an aura, I often wonder exactly what the energy I'm seeing is mm. and whether or not it is something along the lines of a more subtle particle movement. Yeah, uh, I get that. <coughs> Excuse me. I get that totally because I, I don't see auras so much, but I feel them. Yeah. And you, like Mr. Starwolf, who claims to have no affinity for stones and carries about five kilos around every day with him, not that many. My pants would fall down. <laughs> Let's avoid that. Yes, yes, please. But um, <laughs> I, I start thinking, and when this comes up, I start thinking about some of the more esoteric books on magic by a certain um, 20th century occultist, you know, Crazy Uncle Alistair. Um, <laughs> yes, him. A lot of this has 
especially when he starts talking about the abyss and all it it sounds very much of course he was influenced like everybody by 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 buddhist thought because the man was a he may have been insane but he was also a genius yes I just wonder sometimes if it's these are particles they just haven't created a sensitive enough detector to find. Mm. Yes, because we look at all the particles that have been discovered recently. Mm -hmm. And every last one of them was found with bigger, better, and better detectors that could smash atoms together and then sort through millions of particles that flew off as a result. And, and now, now you know why Yale has a 10 farad capacitor. Right. And Egyptian uh, science really hates things it can't measure. I was always yep. taught that if it does not have a mathematics, it's not science. <laughs> so Problem is when I, I start reading when I start reading quantum mechanics, it starts to read like, once again, it, it reads like, like Crowley. It's like paging well, to the book of yeah, the book. yeah, I mean, like, the, the stuff I've been reading, the farther we get down into quantum physics, the closer we get to the true origins of the universe and the fate of the universe. And the quantum foam explains the endless destruction and recreation of the universe. And there was even some wise ass who looked at one part of the mathematics that only about six people in the world can understand and said, you know, if you read that the right way, it could mean that the next quantum droplet to pop out of the foam could be an entire universe that just experienced its big bang. So we could just, our entire existence could just be a little quantum droplet in somebody's larger mm -hmm. universe. And at that point, my head exploded and I stopped reading. <laughs> well, what's oh. also interesting is um, back to when Yoda was lecturing Luke and his, he said, luminous beings we are, not this crude matter. Mm -hmm. And I was flat had a flashback to reading Castaneda <laughs> where, where Don Juan is explaining that be, living beings are basically eggs of luminous fibers. Yes. It, so it, the idea that, you know, we make that connection back to the fact that it, we are energy at the mm -hmm. core and, and, and the matter is something like, I, I just see is either rust on the surface or something that condensed out in the cold temperatures of reality. And when you stop and look at the mathematics behind the conversion of energy to matter, <clears throat> it takes a lot of energy to do that. But yeah, I think ultimately that since we arose from a source that creates something out of nothing. We became something, and that something is more energy than anything else. Mm -hmm. I, I hate to, to cut this short, but, but we are coming to the end. Mm -hmm. I want to give mm -hmm. Lorenz a, a chance to, uh, to maybe uh, Sorry, did, have a- Didn't mean to take over your conversation. Yeah. Well, I kept it's asking questions. My, my yeah. thought here, is one of the things that really <laughs> hampers us is we lack a vocabulary. I mean, we can talk about energy. Yep. Oh, energy yes. is basically movement. Is mm. Does it have to be electrons? No. Can it be more subtle? Yes. We don't have a um, vocabulary for that. But as far as energy into matter, and we assume right now because we are most familiar with what are pretty gross examples like electrons rather than mm -hmm. much more subtle mm -hmm. things that it would take a lot of energy, but perhaps it takes just the right particles. Mm. Exactly. Yeah. As it were, so. to, to, to paraphrase from um, Terry Pratchett, we haven't discovered the thom yet, which yeah. is their unit of magical energy. Yes. Ah. So... We know about energy with electrons. 
Mm-hmm. And yep. well, that's interesting because I will admit that I've been thoroughly grounded in uh, Einstein's e equals mc squared, but that's also thoroughly grounded in Newtonian for, uh, fundamental particles. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And there's a long way down to the basement from there, and maybe it is. We haven't found the effective particles that will do what we want. And maybe, well, <clears throat> we're learning something new every day. And on a good day, everything you know is wrong. And I, I read mm -hmm. that, you know, little new discoveries in astrophysics, overturning fundamental ideas we've held for five or six decades about the structure of the universe. I can't wait. Mm -hmm. okay. One of well, my I definitions of quantum mechanics has always been it's the dirty little bar where magic and physics meet to have an affair <laughs> <laughs> okay so on, on that i'm going to i'm going to uh, stop the recording thank thanking Carenza for for coming and starting the you know, we've shared something practical and we've shared a whole lot of theoretical stuff the so theoretical uh, is actually the fun yes it really is and I'm going to remind everybody that we have a lot more fun at the conference, which will be coming mm -hmm. up in November, the 7th to the 13th. Oh. And uh, go over to Changing Times, the, the, con the uh, conference page, and register uh, and tell, tell your friends about it, because this is a hell of a lot of fun. So. And hopefully next year, if we can meet in real life, I'll bring some of the toys along, and mm -hmm. we will mm. once again do... Do the uh, do my uh, thing. But, yeah, do do, do we'll my do thing on <laughs> on. I'll, I will do the weird science. There you w -Y -R -D. go. W Y R D science.